name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ, you are the King of Advent. You are the Prince of Peace and you are the promised Messiah. As we turn in your presence this Advent season and reflect on your word, may you speak hope to our hearts now and allow the riches of your word, the bread of life, to come alive that you may feed from it so that we hunger no more. In Christ's name we pray. Please be seated. A very good morning to you all present with us here physically, to you who are connecting with us on KBC, and to you who are joining us on our virtual platforms on YouTube and Facebook. We say karibuni sana as we reflect on God's word uh, today. In this Christmas uh, season, Advent season, December, we've been reflecting on the theme of hope. And last Sunday, we spoke about hope for today. We looked at Isaiah 55, where the prophet outlines the need that uh, the children of Israel had. Then he talks about the promise that God gave them. And then finally, about the miracle that the Lord ministered to them. Today, we talk about hope for the future. And largely we'll base this in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 1 to verse 11, but you can read it all the way to verse 16, and make mention of our reading in Luke, uh, the prayer of Zechariah. And so, hope is a desire and an expectation uh, for something usually positive to happen. Occasionally we'll have negative, but Largely, hope has embedded with it, it a positive desire or a positive outcome or a positive expectation for the future. The future that uh, Isaiah is talking about here, because in chapter 1, the prophecy is about the future. What uh, Zechariah prays in chapter 1, verse 67 to 79, equally, it's about the future. Let me help break down that future into three uh, as a way of introduction. That future, in the immediate context of the writing of Prophet Isaiah, meant the expected first coming of Jesus Christ, which fairly was imminent but later delayed. So in Isaiah, several places, both chapter 11 uh, even chapter 9, chapter 52, verse 12, all the way to chapter 53, across various other prophetic books, there is the mention that a Messiah will come uh, to rescue, to redeem the children of Israel. So the first interpretation and meaning of that future is the immediate context of the children of Israel. Because remember, as we shared last week, they are in captivity, of course, uh, in Babylon, in, 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 in Assyria, and later in Babylon, and they're in a devastating situation. So Isaiah speaks hope to them that this will not last long, that the Lord will turn around this, and we saw that in the promise last Sunday. So the immediate context of the children of Israel. But the second um, meaning of this future, this prophecy that Isaiah gives here, is what happens in the Gospels, it is about um, what actually Zechariah even talks about, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus has come, the first um, uh, has, has a, happened that the prophets talked about of Messiah coming, but now in the Gospels and in the New Testament, now they are looking forward to another coming of Jesus. That is the second coming, the second return, which has not happened up to now we still look forward to that second return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Severally, in the New Testament, mention is made of Jesus Christ coming a second time. I will only mention uh, John chapter 14, verse 3. Jesus says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you also may be. So he's talking about him coming and taking the church to be with him. But the third reference to that future 
is actually an interesting one. It's a future that is both distant and immediate in our context. It's a future that stands in between the first prophecy and the second prophecy. The first prophecy was that Jesus will come as the Messiah, and he has come. So in the New Testament, we encounter a Jesus who is already present, and we read of him working miracles. So that has been fulfilled. But then there is a second prophecy of him returning, coming again uh, at the end of times. That has not happened. So the third future referred to uh, in these passages and elsewhere in scripture is a future that we call interminent. This intermediate future. That is our lived context, where you and I are at today. So when we live today, we have an expectation of a tomorrow. We have an expectation of an immediate or slightly distant future, as much as we have an expectation and hope for a very distant future when Christ will come again. So that is the three-level understanding of the future that Prophet Isaiah and other writers in Scripture talk about here. And therefore, God speaks to us hope, not just then or later, but even hope in our context today for the things that we're looking forward to. Remember how I defined hope is a desire and an expectation, is a looking forward to something good that will happen. So I list four things that come out from this chapter 11 as a way of exposition and application. So number one in this chapter, from verse one, we see God's promise. God's promise. In verse one, he says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesus, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And so that is a promise that something will happen. Really interesting, because Paul later, in Romans chapter 15, verse 12, actually clarifies that. The beauty of scripture is that when you read the Bible, you realize that the Bible interprets itself. So when you're struggling here and wondering, what is this, this rod? What is this term of Jesse? What is this branch? What is this root that is being talked about here? Very easily, Paul later in Romans says that that root from Jesse, from the house of David, is Jesus Christ. So the promise here is Jesus Christ, who will come, as I've mentioned in my introduction. That promise is set on the backdrop of a very devastating experience for Israel. As I did mention last week, that Israel sinned, then they were taken into captivity. So they are slaves. And that destruction of Judah and Israel is exemplified by what the prophet says in chapter 10. If you looked back at chapter 10, he talks about trees that were cut. Um, and he, he, he says in verse uh, 34, he will cut down the thickets, uh, the thickets of the forest with iron. Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So there is mention of a tree that is being cut, that is being felled. That felling of the tree symbolizes the fall of the house of David, the fall of the children of Israel. So that, that really necessitates the promise that the children of Israel, God had spoken about them. And in Exodus chapter 19, he had said that you will be for me a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You will be my reward forever. That is what God had said of the children of Israel. But we see because of sin in Isaiah and other prophetic books that that promise is, is, is not coming forth because God released them into slavery. And so in that state of slavery, there comes shame. There comes embarrassment. And a nation that was of significance and of purpose and of high standing, a royal priesthood and a royal family has sunk into insignificance. And that is the symbolism of the cutting of the trunk of the tree. It's like you go and cut a mugumo tree right across through and it falls down. That is what has happened to Israel. Then Isaiah comes and says, no, 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 it's not done. Come on, it's not done. Ash, actually, let me just say verbatim, that the stem, 
that there shall come forth a rod, a shoot from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. So he's saying, though the tree has been felled, no, 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 it's not over yet. Because the Lord will cause it to grow again. The Lord will cause it to spring forth. If you uh, cut a tree, even the ordinary tree in your home, and then after three months or thereabouts, then you begin seeing shoots uh, are beginning to grow out of it. And that actually gives you life. You think that the tree is dead, but then you say, whoo, it's coming off again. Friends, that is a context of our sharing. That the hope that Christ Jesus gives, that Paul qualifies in Romans chapter 15, verse 12, is set in the context of devastating experiences that humanity go through. That you and I go through experiences that leave our hearts heavy. Some of us, our hearts are wounded. Our hearts are broken and bleeding. We've lost our loved ones. Our marriages maybe have broken. Our children have gone wayward. Our enterprises have collapsed. Our economic situations are dire and worrying. We look at the states of the nations around us and things are not promising. We see Ukraine and Russia and we say the end of the world is coming about. But the Lord speaks hope and says it is not over yet. That a stem will spring from the root of Jesse, from the house of David. Simply meaning that the same way stems sprout from the stump of a tree that is cut, so will God renew our hopes where hopes had been dashed. And we'll reestablish the pillars of our lives where they were felled. That the God of Israel promises renewal and a fresh start. That is the hope for the future. It simply means, therefore, that you and I need not to despair when things go south. When nothing positive seems to be happening around you, that you need to hang on and hold on to the promise of the one from the lineage of Jesse. He is called Jesus Christ, the son of the living God who shines light in darkness, who gives birth to new beginnings, who picks people from the bottom pits and gives them a restart that we should never give up. So number one is a promise. Number two, in verse two is the anointing. Isaiah speaks and says that that Messiah who is coming will be endured by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, and the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That simply means that this Messiah, for him to actualize, because he's the agent of the realization of the promise of God, that he needs the anointing of God. And that anointing, spoken there, presents the presence of God the Son, of course, earlier in verse 1, and the Spirit here. So that the triune God is present with the Messiah, activating and realizing the promise of God. Do you know that Jesus, when he began his ministry, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he says, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And he has anointed me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. That is the anointing that Jesus claims as he began his ministry. And that springs from verse 2 of chapter 11. The prophecy that was said that the Spirit of God will be upon him. And as he begins, if you read the New Testament, in particular John, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11, dotted with miracles of Jesus Christ, left, right, and center. That, those miracles spring from the anointing that the Son of the living God carries. It then tells us that Jesus Christ alone, under the heavy weight of the anointing of God, can open the prison gates and release humanity from all forms of bondage. And that him alone can escort prisoners through the gates of freedom and victory, where they no longer can live under the control and manipulation of Satan. That can only be done by Jesus Christ, son of the living God. Actually, Zechariah, in his prophecy, read to us by uh, Captain Mirotsi, says in, our, in Luke chapter 1, 
verse 69 and verse 74, he says, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Verse 74, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. That really is what Jesus does. And Zechariah sees it in his vision and says, he has been released to rescue us from the hands of our enemies. So the word there is rescue. But Luke, in Luke, John, Jesus talks about uh, freedom. He talks about um, recovery of sight for the blind. And he talks about um, actually freedom really captures that. So freedom and rescue. What, what do we pick from this, beloved? That as we look forward to the Lord turning around things and things getting better in our dim and dire situations, that there is only one person who qualifies to do that. And that is the person that Luke, uh, Isaiah sees in verse 2 of chapter 11, is the one that Zechariah prophesies about in verse 60, um, in verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 69, verse 74, is the one who proclaims himself in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that he is able, he can, he qualifies. And therefore, if you're here and maybe your hopes have been dashed, things have become, become grim and dull and hopeless, that darkness engulfs you and depression and worry and anxiety over things sometimes you have zero control over. If you are here and you feel that life is meaningless to live and that you draw the transit to the other world, if you look at your children and you feel that you could feed them salvation and they get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, or you look at your husband and say, I wish I could get one to exchange for this one, and you live in regret and despair and in hopelessness with a heavy heart. If you are here in this sanctuary, and you feel that you have to smile so that Evans and other people who seated around you may see the smiles from you, but in your heart, you are bleeding and your heart is broken. Friends, the son of the living God who causes the entire world to come to a standstill to celebrate Christmas, even across the Muslim nations, he's called Jesus. He qualifies to break the yokes of bondage. He qualifies to open the prison gates and send you through the gate in victory. That is him. He does it for every man and woman who chooses to give their lives to him. So number two is the anointing. Number three, in verse three to verse five, is God's righteousness. In verse three, uh, he says in verse three, that he delights in the fear of the Lord. Actually, that is righteousness. In verse 4, he says, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. And in verse 5, um, actually, that is verse 5. And then in verse 4, he says, with righteousness, he shall judge the poor. So, in each of those verses, there is a mention or an implication of righteousness. And actually, Zechariah also mentions righteousness in verse 75 where he talks about rescuing us from our enemies that we may serve him out of fear, he says, in holiness and righteousness, we shall serve him before him all the days of our lives. So Isaiah, uh, Zechariah equally mentions righteousness. Simply means that the king of kings, the one who redeems, who rescues, who grants us freedom, is interested in right living. You know, many times we want the breakthroughs of the Lord and uh, we want the Lord to do things for us. We trust the blesser to bless us. But seldom do we desire to walk right with the blesser so that the blessings can come and overtake us in the process of walking right with the blesser. So that you don't have to come and kneel and say, the Lord bless me. Bless me with this. Bless me. They happen automatic, automatically as a consequence of right walking with the Lord. Moses, in Exodus chapter 33, walks with the Lord, and the Lord favors him. And in verse 19 of Exodus chapter 33, the Bible says, the Lord promises to cause all his goodness to go before Moses. So when you walk right with God in righteousness, 
then he allows his goodness to go before you, even when things are not right. Sometimes that may tarry, but the Lord causes that to be part and parcel of the package of your living so that you don't live in a desperate life. You don't live like somebody who does not know the Lord. You live like a son who has a right to the home. Do you know there's a difference between a, a son to a home and a worker in a home? A son to a home has all the rights and can access all the privileges they're in in the home. They will not beg, Mommy, can I eat the leftover sausages? Or can I have ice cream? Your son will not ask you, Dad, can I go till that land? They have right of access to the privileges they're in in the house of their father. God is your father, beloved, this Christmas. And when you walk right, you become his son. Then you have direct access to the privileges and the blessings that indwell the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And because righteousness characterizes the rule of God, his call on us, therefore, is to identify with him in righteousness by surrendering our lives to him so that in the process of living, he may bless us. But even beyond that, that later at the time of judgment, he will fairly judge us. I don't know what your walk with the Lord is like, by the way. Especially this Christmas, I mentioned last Sunday. There are lots of things hanging up in the air. And by the way, this is a season, I'll tell you, out of a few years of ministry, this is a season with the highest concentration of evil in our world, across, across every continent, across every country. This is where fresh young boys and girls will go and try out things that they've never tried. This is the time that people who've tried to walk right with God will say, just for once, let me just indulge for once. And your friends will tell you, no, just once is not bad. You know, January, we'll go back to the normal life. So it's the season with the highest concentration of evil. The Lord is calling from this congregation, and I hear us, men and women who will resolve and say that I want to walk right with God. That even in parties that I attend or that come to my house, even in places where I go, that I will restrain myself and allow righteousness to define my life. Lastly, number four, in verse six, from verse six to verse 11, we then see the rule of God the rule of God. So we have seen uh, from verse 1, we have seen the promise. Verse 2, we saw the anointing. Verse 3 to verse 5, we saw the righteousness of God. And in verse 6 to verse 11, we see the rule of God. The rule of God here means that the government of Jesus, which as I speaks of here, he says the unthinkables will happen. I love what he says here. You know, you can't really get your head around it. Where he says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. How? How? The leopard will lie with the young goat together. How do you lie with food there? You lie just with food together, honestly. That the calf and a young lion um, and the little child, the calf and the young lion and the little calf, the calf and the young lion and the fatling will be together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze together. I mean, that a nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. What Isaiah is painting there is restoration of order. When Christ comes to rule in that hope that is spoken of, when Christ comes to establish his kingdom, then he restores order. One of the things that happens in that order is peace. That he neutralizes the ferocious enemies who want to destroy and consume us. And that's really what happened when you choose to dwell inside of Christ. As a sneak preview of eternal life that will come when Jesus comes a second time, did you know that even today when you accept Christ, there is a sense in which you enjoy this restored order, this restored rule of God where Christ reigns over all. When God restores his goodness uh, the goodness of creation, then all humanity, all created order will submit to his rule and will play by his terms. 
When Christ then is enthroned, then he even restores relationships where there was once hostility. That he deals with hearts from holding grudges and being deposits of unforgiveness against each other. That Christ releases us when his rule is over us. That when that rule of God reigns and envelops us, when we prioritize that rule, then men and women will break forth from this life and see the Lord turn upside down things that have held them captives under the rule of Satan. So God will restructure the power structure and bring you up because salvation and the experience of God is not just about for a coming future, even today. We experience victory today because the king of kings begins to rule. That's what I called a sneak preview, a precursor of eternity and heaven, the rule of God. But that happens when we recognize that there is a promise, when we recognize that, that the promised Messiah has anointing on him to deal with our enemy, and that he wants us to walk in righteousness, then he establishes his rule when we walk right with him. I pray, beloved, that this Christmas we may choose to identify with Jesus so that the way the prophet Elijah prayed in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, that, Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Today, let everyone know that there is a God in Israel. Let them know that I'm your servant. Let them know that I've done all these things because you commanded me to do. That you can one time pray and say, Lord, let people know that I'm your child. When they see your rule and reign, dominate my life, my family, and my affairs. That is the hope that Christ speaks to us this Christmas. May you respond to Christ and say yes to his call of salvation that you may experience that. Share this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.